I do feel a lot of stress and I'm actually seeing a therapist now that uh, is helping me understand that I, I don't actually feel stress uh, and that's a problem. Hi, I'm Michael Hyatt. And I'm Megan Hyatt Miller. And this is The Double Win, a show about winning at work and succeeding at life. You know, here at our company, Full Focus, we've identified nine life domains that you can cultivate to help you be the person that you want to be and live the life that you want to live. Those are body, mind, spirit, love, family, community, money, work, and hobbies. Our guest today is Donald Miller, who... Probably the most important thing I could say is that he's my dear friend. I've known him for over 20 years. I was his publisher at Thomas Nelson Publishers. I had the privilege of publishing the book, Blue Like Jazz, which went on to become a New York Times bestseller. Don is one of the best storytellers I've ever met. He wrote a book called Building a Story Brand. This is when he started to pivot from writing memoirs to helping business people tell better stories about their businesses. And more recently, He's uh, talked about what you can do using a story framework to edit your own life and begin to improve it so that you're living a better story. And so I'm excited for what you guys are going to learn from Don today. We had a far ranging conversation about a lot of different topics, and I think you're going to love this. Don, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having We're me, so guys. We're so excited about this. Yeah. I have been, I've been so looking, looking forward, forward to, it. Yeah, to this. Me too. Yeah. Because I know we have immense rapport. And as I already mentioned in the intro, we've known each other since forever. So it's gotta be 20, 20 years, 25 years close wow. to that, right? Yeah. Y'all were kids. I wasn't even born then. I know. I mean, it goes all the way back to blue like jazz. Um, but so it's been, a, it's been a while and we've been friends. We've been in a professional relationship. You know, it's just been awesome um, to kind of see your journey. It's been inspiring to me. And that's kind of what we want to talk about today. Yeah is how that changed because, as you know, we're all about the double win here, winning at work and succeeding at life. But my guess is that for you, there was probably a time back when you were a bachelor. By the way, how old were you when you got married? 42. 42. So you had a long period as a bachelor. And my guess is that you worked differently then than yes. you work now. Yes. Well, I work now. <laughs> <laughs> there, he's kind of kidding, but not really. Okay, say more. I, I literally think I get more done with less time now than I did then because, you know, it, it's kind of like if your flight leaves at two in the afternoon, you're going to miss it. But if it's at six in the morning, you'll make it. You know, there's that sort wow. of feeling of, of uh, you know, it, I've got to get up early. I've got to get this done. You only have two hours. I mean, this morning I had an hour and 15 minutes to write before this meeting and I got more done than if you would have given me four hours. You know what I mean? Wow. Because you're taking it seriously. And uh, as a bachelor, I would wake up and depending on what sort of mood I was in, I would go to whatever coffee shop where I, quote, believed the words were and uh, <laughs> try to find That's them. amazing. You know, it was just ridiculous. And now it's like, no, you have to get you have to start writing now and you have yeah. you have one hour and, you know, I, I get it done. So having a, you know, being married was the first evolution of sort of taking away a slot of time, making you focus and get done in the time you have. And then a child took it all away. I mean, you know, I've got 60 seconds a, a week to, to actually get, <laughs> well, to get I, other work done. I can remember back in the day when I was your publisher and, you know, we struggled to get manuscripts from you some. Oh, I know. I, I, used to, I used to say, well, they're not threatening to sue me yet, so I think I have more time. <laughs> that's, that's a bar. That's a bar you can have. But also, of course, I noticed that the editors over time would come back and say, this is great. I'm like, well, you haven't seen, I haven't turned it in yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were immensely talented, which made us be patient because we knew that it was going to be great when we got it. But you have become so productive, like in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 five years. years. Five, five years. It's been a book a year for wow. a while. Yeah. I mean, every time I turn around, you're writing a new book. Yeah. And, you, and the amazing thing is, is you're kind of pivoting a little bit. You've written on a lot of different things. But again, just to your point, it's amazing how sort of boundaries and constraints That's right. force creativity. That, that, yeah. And production. Yeah. You know, if you want to get it done. And also habits. I think a lot of that is I got into the habit of getting up, leaving the house, literally ordering the same cup of coffee. When I go to Stay Golden, 
I order the same thing every day. If that changes or if I'm ordering to go, I have to bypass the line, go into the kitchen and tell Roger not to cook that because he'll see me and he'll start cooking. It's wow. that it's that much of a habit to show up at this time and do this work. And uh, and I think it's the habit that obviously I credit with the productivity more than anything else. Is it so five days a week? It's uh, yeah, it's it's it tries to be five days a week. But, you know, if I've got a morning meeting, you know, this mm -hmm. morning I had a meeting. Uh, then that day is, but even if I have a morning meeting, the, the, you know, today was nine o'clock. So from seven to eight 30, I was able to get some writing done. And if you can establish any, I tell this to every writer, a young writer, if you want to be a writer, you need to pick a time and you need to be at the same place every day because your body will just get used to it mm -hmm. and your body will perform those tasks without mm. you even thinking about it. And so it's, it's true with working out. It's true with writing as well. So what's a typical day like for you? I literally, you know, tell me that we're related without telling me, <laughs> but I was going to ask that very question. The telepathy is real. Yeah. Okay. So can I walk you through a perfect day? Cause they're often yeah. interrupted. Yeah. So, so tell us a perfect day and then tell us what like a real day. How, yeah. <laughs> how is that different? We want to make the people feel yeah, better. Yeah. does it come you know? off the tracks? Yeah. So 6 a.m. Uh, usually waking up in the summer because the sunlight is, you know, just creeping through every crack and that's getting me up. Uh, I, without waking my wife, I go downstairs mm -hmm. into the garage. I get a cold plunge in oh, wow. three minutes at 45 degrees. And wait, this is your perfect day? This is the perfect day. Okay. So I've done that. Start I've done off that. freezing. I've that's done good. that with the exception of the few days that I've been out of town, less than 10 days in the last six months. I've not done that. Okay. I got to wow. stop. Why do you do that? Why do you do this crazy thing? Uh, yeah. Well, well, you can get into the neuroscience of it. It, it creates a dopamine release. Mm -hmm. And so it, it just puts you immediately in a good mood. But I'll describe it to you this way. I walk down those stairs to the garage, not wanting to work out, not wanting sure. to cold plunge, really just wanting to go back to bed. Yeah. Me too. I, I have a ritual. Uh, the cold plunge, actually, the water evaporates over time. Hmm. So you lose about an inch every two weeks. And- so to counter that, I started just grabbing one glass of water and pouring it in the cold plunge before I cold plunge. That way, you know, just sort of counter the evaporation. But I turned that into a morning ritual where I will close my eyes and imagine some sort of characteristic that I want to pour into myself. Ooh. And then Ooh. I pour the water, close my eyes, and I hear the water going in, and I try to imagine kindness or patience or discipline. So what is it right now? What are you working on? Uh, this it's right now it's for other people. Actually, okay. there's a, a buddy who had a heart attack. And mm -hmm. so I'm pouring good health into as I pray, Wow, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a silly ritual, but I read, I listened to a podcast about the power of rituals uh -huh. and it, it convinced me all these great athletes use rituals. Astronauts mm -hmm. use rituals, uh, just to get their head in mm -hmm. the right place. Mm -hmm. So that's the very first thing. 45 degrees. It was 35 degrees, Woo! but 45 degrees. Did I you mean, have to work up to that? Uh, probably I, I started in the pool over winter and my record was, it was negative one degrees mm. outside and it was 35 degrees in the pool and I did 17 minutes, which oh was a my goodness. really dumb, very dumb thing to do. Wow. I, I think I'd start with 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, uh, but I, you know, I did that and then and now it's, I limit my, I make myself get out after three minutes. I won't stay in any longer because it's honestly just not great for your heart to mm. be in cold. Having done long. it this long though, um, in three minutes, like is the first few seconds, is it like, oh, maybe, maybe two seconds. And on a hot day, it's actually the whole thing is just refreshing. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you, you, get, you, you get adapted to it, but it's a 400% increase in dopamine. There is probably not a drug legal or illegal that will do that. Huh. Uh, and immediately, like I would say within 60 seconds, I am in a good mood. And I want to work out. That's uh, so, amazing. It, it happens. It happens by the by the end of the three minutes. I'm in a good mood for four or five hours. Now mm -hmm. you can overdo that. You have to be careful. Your brain will actually run out of dopamine, and you can get depressed. You have to really mm. be careful with it. So wow. I do three minutes. I get out. I, I yesterday I did twice, but I shouldn't have. <laughs> you know, most days I'll do it once, uh, and really it should be every other day. So okay. is, is this like the hard thing that you do that makes everything else easier? You know, they say that. I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel that, hmm. you know, hard things are still hard things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like 
I got in cold water, so now I can, you know, go lay off somebody. <laughs> you know, it's not it's like that's not that isn't happening for me. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> you know, hard things are very contextual. This yeah. one is hard, and so is that one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the the benefits of working out. I mean, just getting a ten to fifteen minute resistance training workout mm. after that cold plunge is easy. And so I'll do that. And do that's you cardio not- too? Sorry. I do five minutes on a rebounder, five minutes on a bike, five minutes on a rower, and five minutes on a heavy bag. So it's a 20-minute cardio workout, about three days a week. And then uh, the same with resistance training. And I just use bands nice. for that. That's great. And that wasn't always part of your life, right? No. Like if you go in the Wayback Machine. In the Wayback Machine, I weighed nearly 400 pounds. Yeah. So it was definitely- Which is a stunning I worked harder to, to get out of bed than I yeah. did to work out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At 7 a.m., a little before 7 a.m., I'm coming up out of the garage. I've done a short workout and a cold plunge. I feel much, much better mm. about the day. It's better than caffeine. It's, there's no negative side effect. I heat up a glass of milk and pour it into a sippy cup, and I go into Emmeline's room, and I'm the guy who wakes her up first Aww, thing in the morning. that's so and how old cute. Is she? She's about to be three. Oh, yeah, she's such about a great to turn age. three. I have she's a grandson that is. ridiculously cute. Oh. Uh, and I wake her up and then that gives Betsy about 15 to 20 minutes to sort of slowly get up and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Then she comes in the room, starts making breakfast and I leave. Mm-hmm. That's when I leave. So I leave, I go, I get, uh, from one to three hours worth of writing done. We try to make the first appointment of the day after 11 AM mm-hmm. because writing is just the most important thing for me to do for my yeah. own company. And if I if I get two even two hours of writing done, uh, three to four days a week, I can write a book in a year. Hmm. And so, are you eating anything? I'm just doing the math. Yeah, I like, do. Do I, you eat before eleven or no? I eat. Uh, I do. I, I didn't used to, but hmm. these studies have come out saying yeah. how bad intermittent fasting is for your heart. Yeah. And it's like ninety percent more likely to get some sort of heart wow. yeah. uh, a defect or something like that. So I stopped doing that, and I I eat four eggs in the morning. Uh, I eat them on top of biscuits and gravy, but I don't eat the biscuits and gravy. This is how ridiculous this actually wait, is. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, <laughs> I want the option. That. I want the option. So this morning I ate four <laughs> eggs, 32 grams of protein, and one bite of biscuit. So Roger, the chef at Stay Golden, has now started making me half of a biscuit. I get charged the same, but I'm like, Roger, I just throw this away. Yeah. He goes, well, I'll make you a half. And he makes me a half of a so biscuit. So you just want like a little bite, I gotta and that's enough. I got to have the taste. I got to have the taste. If you take it away from me, I'm going to rob the kitchen. So, <laughs> see, I, I think this, oh this is perfect this is for a me. psychological thing there. Yeah. I don't know what it is. You love some biscuits and gravy too. Oh, I do, and oh, I, but I just know not, that too much of that's not good for you. Oh, so gosh, I, no, it's awful. I mean, maybe once a month I'll, I'll get something like when we're, we're in Winchester. Yeah, the lake. But yeah, so I'll do that, and then um, that if I finish that, if I finish my writing, and I get four or five pages written, or or six or ten pages edited, I feel good about the entire day. There's mm. nothing else. I could st- not work the rest of the day and I would still feel good. There's something in that of all the work I have to do, writing feels like the most important. Mm-hmm. And if you didn't get that done, you didn't contribute what only you can contribute to today. Mm-hmm. So writing is absolute priority. It's also the thing that if you look at everything I do, if you if I don't do the writing, the company dies two years from now. Mm-hmm. And so I'm my job as the leader is to keep us alive two years from now mm-hmm. and always be the the guy furthest out in mm-hmm. front kind of building whatever it is that needs to be built. So I do that. And then, uh, really, you know, from the, sometimes there's a meeting at 11 and I'll go over to the office. We have an office here in Nashville that has shared workspace, a private conference room, and then four different media sets to do live streams and things like that on. So constantly in and out of that office, uh, I'll have meetings, zoom meetings, things like that. Uh, I about four o'clock usually I am winding down heading home Mm -hmm. and then from 430 or so through the end of the night it is time with family Uh, and I I don't have my phone I don't look at it it takes zero discipline go like how do you know I mean it you know it's in the entry yeah uh and I, I truly don't have any interest in looking at it uh I leave work works over for me at 430 I don't think about it. And I, I learned a long time ago that I get more done the following morning if I stop. That And it's, it, you know, I wish I could say it's because 
I'm so devoted to my family. I mean, that's a part of it. That's mm-hmm. the icing on the cake. But the reality is I just get way more done if I stop at 430. Yeah. And don't keep yep. working. And then the next morning I'm recharged and can get some wow. writing done. So that's a, a day in the life. Uh, sometimes interrupted by travel. We try not to travel more than once a month. Mm-hmm. So on most nights I'm home. Okay. I'm asking this for a friend. Um, <laughs> but do you ever get in a place where you're like super creative and I'm kind of in this place right now and like I, I have a really hard time turning it off at night. I'm just like thinking about like last night I probably laid in bed awake for three hours. That's not anxiety, you know, where I'm catastrophizing about the future and yeah. feeling anxious, which, you know, some I've struggled with and I'm getting a handle on finally, but this is just more creative, like all these right. things I want to do. And I'm thinking about projects. Do you ever, have you ever gone through that? I have. And it's actually, to me, I think it's a gift. I, 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 I this creativity is going to come when it wants mm-hmm. and it's not going to obey your schedule. I do believe in schedule. The more often you're there at 7am, the more you're going to yep. get done. But at the same time, if you've got an idea, you know, I just wrote a speech at two in the morning that's coming up in September. And I, I think it'll be, you know, my best, the best presentation I've ever given. Hmm. And it was given to me at two in the morning. And yeah. you just kind of so sit there and it. stare at the ceiling and go, okay, so we're downloading this right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I still, I think it's a gift because, you know, when you have inspiration like that, you feel like you're partnering with God to do yeah. something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, a lot of creatives feel like they're channeling something. Or something magical kind of happening. Yeah. And you can either gut it out or get it in a download. Mm-hmm. And it's certainly a lot easier to get it in a download. Yeah. I'll take it. If it's two in the morning, I'm up. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. I have another question too. Is, is there any kind of spiritual practice that, that you do and does that occur sometime in your day or? Yeah. The, I mean, my, my faith has gotten very, very simple. It hasn't changed. It's, but it's gotten very, very simple mm-hmm. in this, in the, the sense that I think there is a force that, uh, wants to destroy, uh, people and their self-esteem. And, mm-hmm. and there's a force that, uh, believes that people matters matter. And I want to be on the right team. That That's as simple as it really gets. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, so when I see destructive, when I hear destructive thoughts in my own brain, I just say, hey, it's the wrong team. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not going to listen to that. That's about as, that's about where my faith is right now. Mm-hmm. And so in my prayer, I'm praying, God, help, help the words that I write defend the right team. Mm-hmm. You know, I just want to be on the right team. And that team, I think, builds people up, believes in people, believes that they mm-hmm. matter, believes that their story matters. You're so good and at that. And want to encourage them to do that. Yeah. And then... Uh, try to recognize when, hey, I think you're actually playing for the wrong team here, you mm-hmm. know, and let's let's cut that out. So that, that's about it. I love that. So outside of work and family, do you have hobbies or personal interests <laughs> that you're pursuing? Uh, I have a, a group of buddies. We call ourselves the Lions, uh, and we fish once a year. We get together in Nashville for the national championship, the college mm. football national championship. And then we do smaller meetings. I have a listening, I call it the listening parlor at my home. It has a hi-fi stereo system. People bring their records. We do once a quarter, we you just bring some records and, and we'll oh, spend fun. four or five hours just listening to music. Yeah. We're keeping a running list of every song that we've played so that you can go back and go, wait, what was that song by oh, Frank Sinatra? I love you know, that. that sort of thing. Very cool. And that's that's been that's been really fun. And I would say that's that's about the only hobbies that I've got yeah. is just getting together with those guys. Um, is that a struggle for you to have interests outside of work? It is. Yeah. Yeah, it's a struggle. Uh, I do it, and I feel like we've we've nailed it. Uh, but yeah, there's no golf. There's yeah. no. I'm not a cyclist anymore. Yeah. You know, there's none of that. There's no time for is that. Is that something that you want to do in the future, or like I, I find it really interesting? My dad and I talk about this a lot because he's at a stage of life with no kids at home. Although our family has been living with him temporarily while we're renovating right, our yeah. house. So, you know, we're kind of back. Uh, but mostly, you know, you have a lot of discretionary time. I have five kids. I have very little discretionary time because of that. And I think it's interesting to consider hobbies at different seasons. Right. You know, you and I don't have as much time as he does. And so I, I love talking to people about what does that look like in this season? And, you know, yeah, I feel self-conscious saying it. I don't have hobbies. Yeah. I don't have, you know, if you look, if, um, if if your life were like a parking lot and every 15 minutes were a space, yeah. I'm double parked in every space. <laughs> I mean, there's just there's zero. There's no margin yeah. uh, at all. Mm. Uh, I just a buddy of mine's playing a show in New York City and I got so excited because he's selling out these shows and his career's on the rise. And 
I went and bought four tickets and I said, Betsy, we'll just figure out what other couple to take with us. And yeah. she emailed back and said, you realize you're speaking on that night. Oh, no. <laughs> it's like, uh, I hate this. Yeah. I mean, there's just no, you know. This is why I don't handle my own calendar. Yeah. That went, and honestly, that's the problem. I handled my own calendar once. And yeah. Then, uh, yeah, uh, me too. Went rogue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Whenever I make an exception, I screw it up. Yeah, that's exactly it. And, and so, no, uh, you know, I would say that's a, if, if I'm allowed to complain, if I'm allowed to go to HR and say I'm being overworked, <laughs> uh, that would be it. You, you work know, for a double for a really driving boss <laughs> <laughs> for that's myself. I hope so that's not true for everybody else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly it. You know, business isn't easy and you run a sizable business. Um, how many teammates do you have now? 30. 30. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really close to 35, I think. But Yeah. yeah so that brings with it a lot of stress. <laughs> and so how do you kind of manage the stress? How do you think about that? Do you feel that stress? I, yeah, I do. Uh, you know, especially when things aren't going well. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of leaders in my position are good at worrying way before they actually need to. Oh, we're... We have a master's degree in this. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I, PhD. I was going to say, I, maybe a double PhD. Yeah. I mean, I think in a way it's a gift yeah. because it's how you keep an organization alive. I can't remember who was it who said only the paranoid survive. Whoever used to run IBM <laughs> wrote a book called Only the Paranoid Survive. And as soon as I saw the title, I went, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <I'll get laughs> that. No argument there. Uh, and so, yeah, I, 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 I do feel a lot of stress and, uh, and I'm actually seeing a therapist now that uh, is helping me understand that I, I don't actually feel stress, uh, and that's a problem. You know, By the way, <clears throat> the three of us see the same therapist. Well, I didn't want to say it out loud. I didn't well, know if that was allowed. We had a really that. funny experience. We're keeping John her in I, business. I know. We really are. We've referred so many people. You and I ran into each other in the therapy waiting office. <laughs> and what we should <laughs> have room. done is said, look, I'll just be a fly on the wall and pay half. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe we could do like a group session. I know. Right, it's exactly. so true. Yeah. We, we, we definitely have uh, anxiety that we deal with. I'm looking at you, Dad, while we're talking yeah, about this. Yeah. I mean, totally. I mean, I, I went through a period where I had a little health scare starting back in, in November. And uh, it caused me the most anxiety I've ever felt. Yeah. And I never admitted to myself that I ever struggled with anxiety. Now I realize it's probably something I've struggled with my entire adult mm -hmm. life. But it gave me the tools to kind of deal with it. Yeah. But it's, it's, it comes and goes. But now I feel like I've got some tools to effectively manage it. Yeah. yeah. I, I, there are some things that I can do. I can not get on airplanes. If I oh. don't get on airplanes, my anxiety level is much lower. What is it about airplanes? Is the it fact that you have to pause your entire productivity schedule to go to Topeka and give a one hour speech yeah. and then come back without a night's sleep. Yeah. So it's basically let me give up a week of this massive task list so that I can go speak somewhere for 45 yeah. minutes. Yeah. Does that mean you don't speak as much? I don't speak as much. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. I, I, I try to stay home. I try to leave once a month. That ends up being twice a month. Mm -hmm. But that often knocks out three or four days. It's really true. I, I don't like That's to travel. I don't do it. No. I, I mean, I like to travel for fun, but I don't like to travel for business. Yeah, I haven't been able to figure out how this to do This was a game changer for me. I, I now mostly speak at events in Nashville, and Nashville's yeah. become so hot that so many of, um, event planners are having events here, but, or I bring clients in. You know, mm -hmm. I just don't go out to see them. Yeah. And it's, yeah. you know, it's, I know it's a luxury, but it's a period of my life where I'm doing that, focused on that. Yeah. I think it's a smart, a smart decision. So back to this idea of stress, what do you do that helps you manage stress? And what do you do that doesn't help you manage <laughs> stress? Because we all have both. We have yeah. helpful coping strategies and unhelpful coping strategies. Yeah. I mean, the, the two basic things are the cold plunge actually reduces anxiety significantly. Yeah. We need uh, a cold plunge, clearly. I know. Cold plunge. I know. It's, it's not the answer to everything. It's actually... There's a there's trade offs and the trade offs just so everybody knows for cold plunging, I put a, a blood pressure monitor on my blood pressure goes up by forty points whenever I get wow. in that cold plunge. So you are shocking your heart. Yeah. And and even ended up in the hospital with some heart stuff and the doctor didn't think it was because of cold plunging but I do. Yeah. And that was when I was in you know sub thirty five degree water. I mean you're practically turning it into ice. Oh my goodness. So you know that you've got to be really careful about that. The plus side is the dopamine release, the extra energy, the mood boost, mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the willingness, the want, the desire to work out, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all sorts of things. You can just, Andrew Huberman has written a lot yeah. about this. So, you know, um, but there's a downside. Uh, mm -hmm. And I tell people, I have friends who open the garage, come in, cold plunge and leave. And actually one of them, I was like, can I just put this blood pressure monitor on you? I want you to see what's happening. He was yeah. well over 200 in his systolic Woo! when he got in. Wow. So I just said, hey, your call. 
but this is, I just want you to know what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I have turned down the temperature and become adapted to it. So it's not too bad anymore. And my blood pressure is actually slightly under yeah, 120 I'm over too. 80. So, yeah. so I'm okay on that. But you know, that I do that, that reduces anxiety. And then I try to prioritize sleep. Yeah. So we're That's in huge, nature. isn't it? Yeah. And it's actually the hardest battle. Mm-hmm. It is. It's just getting a good night's yep. sleep. And so I have a hard time getting to bed on time. Yeah, same here. My, you know, we, after we put the baby down, it, we used to be seven. Now it's more like seven forty-five. Yeah, we've got about an hour. That's yeah. hard. Is that, I think that's one of the hardest things to reconcile yourself to as a parent. Yes, is that you just get this really truncated evening, and you don't want to talk to each other. You want to yeah. veg out and watch right. TV, but or you whatever. also it's need like, to talk to each other. But then your mornings when your when your little kids get up early, that's hard too. Yeah, we're, we're, we're heading there. That. Yeah, we're heading there fast. Naomi's up at five forty in the morning. It's just Ooh. I know. No, that's yeah. too no. early. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna build our cave. You can get up at five forty in the morning, but you got to go to bed at three in the afternoon. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we got to get that time back somewhere uh yeah so those are the two things and then just it's been a constant battle for 25 years i just try to eat a little bit healthier so i just yeah. try not to eat too much bread too much sugar yeah uh try to go most days without any kind of dessert mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh and that helps a great deal yeah there was a point at which you kind of woke up to your health because as you said you were near 400 pounds and i don't know when that happened or what precipitated that but when did health become a priority for you? And what did you do to get, I mean, you look fantastic today. I don't know if you're at your ideal weight, but you certainly look like it. Yeah. But what was it that was sort of the, as my friend Don Miller would say, the inciting event? <laughs> I was, I remember it. I was, I, uh, I went home to Houston. I spent 20 years in Portland, Oregon, went home to Houston. Blue Lake Jazz had taken off and I had some money. Uh, not a lot of money, but money. Mm-hmm. And I decided I was going to quote unquote remodel my mother's house. And so I ripped out the carpet and started putting in a wood floor. And I don't know what I weighed at the time. I was probably like 350 or something like that. And doing that physical work, realized at 20 whatever years old, mm-hmm. I'm just worthless. Wow. Uh, and it was just that. And I just, that was kind of a moment where I said, this has to stop. That was moment number one. Uh, and then there was another moment that I've, I've struggled to write about because I don't want to give people the wrong impression, but there was a moment back in Portland where, you know, I didn't have any money and, uh, this was before the book had taken off. I was a writer and I, I, I realized, I don't know how I realized it, but I was looking in, literally looking in the mirror, which sounds so cliche and realized that identifying as a victim which is how I identified. Mm-hmm. I identified as somebody that people should feel sorry for, and I felt sorry for myself. And the, the literal re- realization that I had was that it was unattractive. It wasn't yeah. that it was destroying my life or that it was negative or that it was going to, that's the reason that I was, it, it was unattractive. And that if you wanted people to be attracted to you, you should actually try to become a winner. Wow. And I realized that, no, you want people, you want attention, you want recognition, you want people to be kind to you. And the way you're going about it is by pretending to be a victim or convincing Mm. yourself that you're a victim and you're not getting any of that. That's a huge insight. So what if you actually just said, well, I think I'll try being a winner. And I... And I did, and it worked. Okay, so when, <laughs> when did they? Does it. that make sense? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't like I was, you know, like you can do it, you can do it. it, it the realization was, no, you you have an effective strategy that you think to to get what you want, and it, it's not working. Yeah. Like women aren't attracted to you. Turns out, women don't want to nurse their man back to health. That's not what right. they're. Most healthy women are not interested in that. And I just said, well, what if you tried? being a winner what if you tried actually like working hard and being in better shape and you know being somebody that isn't a burden to others and i'm telling you it freaking worked okay, i mean, so I mean the, and it was immediate that's amazing wow. because you were not a winner overnight i mean it wasn't like your whole life changed and suddenly you were successful you had money well you then i had to go attract- out and win <laughs> yeah but but what happened but the it, attitude shifted right yeah, then okay, so there. that's what i want to know more about because you went from I'm a loser well, or the, some version of the that. The real to, realization was that you are a, you know, let's be, you know, we're being blunt here and I don't right. mean to disparage people who are actual victims. I was not an actual victim. Right. I was using victim mentality as a tactic mm. and uh, I was feeling sorry for myself as a tactic 
uh, to get what I wanted. Mm. And I was flopping like a European soccer player all the time. And it was just <laughs> ridiculous. And realized that, quite honestly, I realized that women are not attracted to that. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I realized they're not attracted to that, I went, well, then that's not me anymore. Wow. Well, hey, <laughs> whatever works from a motivational standpoint. Okay. I, I that also brought in a flood of other problems that we won't talk about. Yeah. In this well, podcast. You know, it's, it's an imperfect <laughs> yeah, journey to get yeah, where we want to exactly. go. So you wrote a book, and this is related to what you just said, A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. It's, as I told you before we started recording, this is my favorite book that you've written. I've given mm-hmm. dozens of copies away, including um, our grandson has read this and it had a profound impact on him. But is the story that you just told, where you talk about editing your own story, did yeah. that play into this? I think that was during, that that happened in the season that I was figuring out the stuff that will eventually go into uh, A Million Miles in a Thousand Years, which is essentially that not unlike editing a work of fiction to make it more interesting, you can take the principles that you're using to edit a work of fiction to make it more interesting to the reader and actually apply them to your life. Mm. For example, if you handed me, well, not you, Michael, because I think both of you would probably write a pretty good novel, but let's say an amateur handed me a novel and said, there's, I, I just, I'm really close, but it's not working. Mm. Can you, can you not being so close to the book, read it and just give me some tips. I would probably say things like it is not clear to me what the hero wants. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you've got a great hero. They, they're charming. They've got a great dialect. I love that they live in New Orleans. I don't know what they want. Mm. And so you have to make it very, very clear that they want their boss's job or they want to marry their high school sweetheart or they want to lose 30 pounds or they want to solve the murder. There has to be something that the hero wants that, that is incredibly defined. And then they go back and they fix that. And they come back and they say, still not working. And I said, well, okay, let me read it again. Here's why it's not working. The hero wants seven things. They can Mm. only want one. And every story is about a hero who wants one thing, Mm. right? Lord of the Rings is not about trying to destroy the ring and rebuild the infrastructure in the in the village (laughs) 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 because what happens is you're actually asking the audience to watch two stories at the same time Mm -hmm. and they can't do that they can't it creates too much cognitive dissonance literally the brain has to over process and burn too many calories and Mm. the survival mechanism in your brain is when you have to burn too many calories it will shut off Mm. so you're you're, you're gonna have daydreaming so what so okay let's just take those two there's many more but let's just take those two things. Well, that what that means is that your life needs one, and we call it in screenwriting, a controlling idea. Your life needs one controlling idea. Hmm. You know, so for if I could say what you guys' controlling idea would be, it would be the pursuit of the double win. Yep. You know, well, and you say, well, Don, isn't that like two things or so? Well, yes, but you've worded it in such a way we can get our mind around mm-hmm. one. Yeah. One thing can be two things, and it can have a dozen subplots. Yeah. But it has to. It has to be one thing. Uh, that thing also has to be mutually beneficial. So if your goal is to hoard all the money in the world, well, you've got a great single focus thing, but it makes you an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that also doesn't work. So there are these rules in screenplay. That, that, by the way, that principle is called Save the Cat. Mm-hmm. And there's a book by Blake Snyder called Save the Cat that has f- affected almost every movie you see in the theater for yep. the last yeah. few years. Great book. Fantastic book. And when he says save the cat, what he means is make the hero do something kind early in the movie so mm. the audience roots for them and wants them to get what they yeah. want. And so there, there are all sorts of little tips that, that you use to write a better story, mm. and they all work to, to, as life principles uh, to uh, live a better life. You know, One of them is uh, the hero has to face their challenges rather than run from them. Yeah. Uh, another one is the only way – if you have somebody who weighs 400 pounds and at the end of the movie they weigh, you know, 160 and they're in great shape and they they did that because they decided to, you'll lose the audience. Mm. They can't, it, it, that doesn't work uh, in a story because it's not true in life. You, nobody wakes up and says, I'm going to change because I want to. Mm-hmm. They wake up and say, I'm going to change because I have to. Yeah. So I don't now, like this about life. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is on my list. But of you can control it. Yeah. So let's say that you want to get into good shape. It's super easy. Sign up for a marathon. Yeah. You have to throw yourself into a situation where you are forced to change. Uh, adopt a kid. Yeah. 
right? I raised my hand the girl. high. Marry the girl, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, you know, you force yourself into these life situations. And literally, I was at 276 pounds when I signed up to ride a bike across America and finished at 216. Wow. You know, we were, we were averaging 13 miles per hour on the day we left. We were averaging 26 on the day we got to Delaware. That's amazing. That is a transformation. Yeah. I mean, nobody averages 26 unless you're in the Tour de France, mm. right? And so, you, you know, you have to force yourself into – and that, there's another principle of screenwriting and storytelling. The only way people change is through pain. Yeah. That's it. That's the I also only, don't like that. The only, I, know that. <laughs> I know, really don't is, like that. I don't know that. if it's – I don't know if it's God's design, but I think it's God's redemption. Yeah. Mm. I don't think there's supposed to be pain. Mm -hmm. You know, my faith would say there's yeah. not supposed to be the sort of pain mm -hmm. that we experience mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, but God's redemption is I'm going to use it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use it for good. Yep. And if we agree with that and say, okay, well, we have to experience pain. So why don't we just use it for good yeah. and use it to transform ourselves, mm -hmm. I think is a, is a redemptive perspective on suffering. So the premise of a million miles in a thousand years is basically- Edit you your own life. Edit your own life. In real time. a better story. Yeah. And, and when I may say a better story, I don't mean a story that impresses people. I mean a story that um, is actually meaningful to live within. Mm -hmm. So it's really about you experiencing more meaning in your own life. I'm going to put you on using the spot. These, use these principles to do so. What is it that you want? In my life right now? Mm -hmm. I would say that the single focus is in the negative is to not negatively affect my daughter's life. Hmm. That's it. I mean, it, 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 and so I want to I want to build a legacy that she's proud of. Uh, I I want to be present so that she doesn't she doesn't wake up someday and be attracted to a man who isn't present because she's trying to fix mm -hmm. the brokenness between mm -hmm. her and her father. Mm -hmm. uh, the other day we were on an airplane and a gentleman kind of leaned over and said, you are beautiful. And she said, I know. Oh, I love <laughs> and he that. turned and looked at me and he goes, good dad. Oh, <laughs> that is beautiful. You know, so, and I, I mean that as a, as a sort of controlling idea that affects everything else. You know, be faithful to her mother, be kind, be present, mm -hmm. uh, provide financially, don't spoil you know, mm -hmm. if you if you get that right, you got a lot of things right. Mm -hmm. do, do you think a controlling idea shifts over time? Like there's a oh, hundred percent. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and I think it's phases of life. I think when when you are young and single, I think you are learning, and you need to you need to earn respect. You need to even to yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to create and earn an identity. Mm -hmm. And then I think usually about the time we become parents, we begin by necessity, becoming less selfish and start thinking about how other people yeah. can win. And then by the time you're my age, you, you're, you're beginning to transition into the wise sage who's mm -hmm. more interested in helping other heroes get out of their hole. Mm -hmm. And uh, those things are all really satisfying. I would say if you're controlling idea, if what your story is about doesn't shift and change, something's wrong. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think of it almost as sequels. I, I want to take something you just said. Sorry, Meg. Do you have a question? I do. You're okay. trying to get in here. It might be the same question now. It might be. Well, my question is, the phrase you just said, um, helping the hero in a hole. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I did an interview yesterday, totally different topic. But you mentioned that phrase, and I was thinking about it all night, actually. But that's the role of the guide. Yes. Talk about that in the story structure and how it fits into life. Well, every story starts with a hero in a hole. Uh, it actually starts with a hero who has a stable life, and within about four minutes, they have to be in a hole. <laughs> and the whole movie is about the hero getting out of the hole. That's it. So, you know, let's say we're writing a rom-com. A uh, gentleman meets a young woman at a coffee shop, maybe spills some coffee near her, cleans it up. They have a meet-cute moment. They sit down. We now know what the hero wants. Or, and the audience wants them to get together. We really like these two people. Mm -hmm. and, and, but if we, if we have them getting married in the next scene, we've ruined the movie. Mm -hmm. There has to be conflict and there has to be change. So... We, we, the woman, after about five minutes, realizes what's happening and says, I have to go. I, I, I shouldn't be talking to you. I have to leave. And she fumbles her papers. She gets and she, and she leaves. And he doesn't have her phone number. He doesn't know her name. None of that. Now we have a hero in a hole. We have a hero who wants something but can't get it. Mm -hmm. And now we have a story. But we want to make the hole deeper. And so the hero gets a call from his mother, says, hey, can you come to dinner tonight? Your brother is in town. And it's been a long time since he's been willing to sit with the family. And the, the, the hero says, well, for good reason. He's a jerk. He's a bully. He's a con artist. 
and I don't want to see him. He said, please, we always have to give a second chance. He's family. So, you know, he goes to the dinner reluctantly and the brother says, I've got an announcement and he introduces his fiance and it's the girl from the <gasps> coffee shop. Now we have a story. <laughs> that and was a legitimate <laughs> gasp. I did not know that was we coming. We have a seek, we have a, 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 a hero who's the love of his life is about to marry the con artist brother. And now we've got a hero so significantly great. in a hole. And so what we need at this point in the screenplay is we need a guide to come along and help them out of the hole. Mm -hmm. So this can be a therapist, it can be a Sunday school teacher, it could be the father, it could be the mother. You know, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes there are multiple guides. But the purpose of the guide is actually to solve a psychological problem. And that is that we know heroes can't get out of holes on their own. Mm -hmm. And if, they, if he does have some realizations and get out of this hole, the audience loses interest because this just is not the way life works. So we are always, in, because in life, you are always looking for somebody who has the knowledge to get you out of this. So probably our therapist, i.e. Goodwill Hunting, mm -hmm. is going to have had a relationship that was very difficult and he solved that problem and now he knows how to get out of the hole and he's going to turn around and help the hero out of the hole. And the whole story is about the hero getting out. There are rules, by the way, for the guide. The guide uh, cannot transform. The guide does not have realizations in the movie that get themselves out of some hole because then we don't know who the movie's about. Mm -hmm. uh, the guide has to be authoritative. They have to know what they are. They don't have to be perfect. Hey, Mitch has a drinking problem, Hunger Games. But mm -hmm. in the area of his expertise where we're using him to help the hero out of the hole, he has to know how to win the Hunger Games. And, of course, Hey, Mitch has done that in the past. Uh, they cannot apologize. Uh, you know, there's a scene, a wonderful scene in Mary Poppins where, where George Banks, the father, who is the hero of the story, confronts Mary Poppins. She mm -hmm. has just instigated a series of events that had his, had the kids go to the bank yeah. and there's a run on the bank. And, and George Banks says, Mary Poppins, explain yourself. Now, there's a critical scene in the book. If Mary Poppins says, well, let me, let me just tell you where I was coming from. First of all, I apologize. The movie is ruined. Mm -hmm. It's ruined because now the guide is transforming. Mary Poppins says, Mary Poppins does not explain herself to anybody. And walks up the stairs. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> so this speaks to the importance that as guides, we have an area in our life that we are extremely competent in. You don't have to be the most competent, mm -hmm. but you have to be a lot more competent than the person that you're helping, mm -hmm. at least in that area. Mm -hmm. And I think as a life lesson there, uh, those of us who are getting older need to decide what, that, what area that is. And we need to refine those skills. And we need mm -hmm. to turn around and use them to sort of help people. Again, you don't have to be perfect. But you've got to be pretty darn authoritative in the area in which you help mm. people out of the hole. So th that's the the guide is used in that. And I and I and I should also say that in Hero on a Mission, the book that I write, wrote maybe a few years ago, I believe that these roles, the victim, the villain, the hero, and the guide, all of which we've talked about, except for villain in this podcast, all of those roles, we think those roles exist in stories because there are people who are victim, villain, hero, and guide. Mm -hmm. Those four roles exist in stories because they all exist in you. All four of those characters exist inside of every human being and they come out every day. Mm. And if you watch a movie, you know, sometimes if you watch tennis, I'm a tennis fan. Sometimes it's really fun when you're watching tennis to not watch the ball, to watch one player, the whole point and watch what they're doing with their feet. Watch and don't follow the ball. And then you'll really learn a lot about tennis. Huh. If you want to learn a lot about life, watch the villain. For an entire movie. Just pay attention to what they're doing and put yourself inside of there. And here's, here's what they are. They have been injured in the past. Mm -hmm. They are bitter about having been injured. And they are seeking vengeance on the world that hurt them. Mm. Which tells us something. And then watch what happens to the villain at the end. They are, in, they are imprisoned. They are killed. They are rightly dealt with because they are evil. Mm. And then ask yourself, where does this show up in my life? Mm -hmm. who, who, who am I bitter against who's hurt me unwilling to forgive and seeking vengeance I want you to know if you can answer that question easily you are in that compartment of your life a villain wow. and what will happen to you over time is what happens to villains in a good movie people will seek justice against you mm -hmm. and they are right to do so but look at the hero the hero has also always been injured in the past in fact 90% of the time they're an orphan watch movies from this point on yeah. Early in the screenplay, they will show you a, a, a father or a mother abandoning them. They are alone in the world mm. and they are having to figure out on their own. This is a way of getting, eliciting sympathy from the audience. So they've been hurt. But what they do with their pain is they decide, I'm not going to let this happen to anybody else. Mm -hmm. 
and they begin ah. they that's the difference instead uh-huh. of seeking vengeance they say no i'm going to not let this happen to anybody else and they become the hero mm-hmm. so how we answer the question what do we do with our pain determines whether or not you become a hero or a villain in a story yeah. it also determines whether or not you become a victim mm-hmm. if you say well i'm going to continue letting this happen to me and i'm going to seek for for rescue you are now playing the victim and what happens to the victim nothing <laughs> <laughs> Nothing yeah. happens to the victim. A, a, a blanket gets put over their their shoulders at the end of the movie, and then the ca- the, the camera goes right back to the hero where it should. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you are playing the victim in life, you're playing a bit part in which you do not transform. Mm. Okay, so one of the things that <laughs> we were talking about a minute ago was the idea of the guide, yeah. and you have really put a stake in the ground around the idea of coaching. And you are now teaching coaches how to be better coaches, how to build their businesses and all of that through Coach Builder. I want you to share why coaching, why is this a passion for you? Yeah. And kind of what do you see the role of coaching uh, in yeah. success and, you know, and all that? And it's a, such a good question. Uh, I, I think just personally, from my personal story, when I look back over the seasons of punctuated evolution, mm-hmm. and by punctuated evolution, I mean seasons of very fast, rapid growth. Two things happen in every one of those seasons, pain and a person. Yeah. So pain and a person who helped me understand the pain, whether it was a therapist or a business leader or a friend, so there was a principal figure who stepped into my life and I can name them. Mm. Many of my books are dedicated to them, wow. uh, of, of, of those people who you know stepped in when my father left or gave me a shot a, a delusional, ridiculous, don't deserve it shot at running their business. Mm. You know, things like that, that, uh, that happened. And so I would, you know, those people, you can call them what they want. I would just call them coaches mm-hmm. and they coached me to success. So one, it's, it's, I believe in the power of it. I believe in the power of relationships to change lives and somebody who is older, wiser, and who has been there, they don't have to be older, but wiser and who has been there to turn around and say, hey, let me help you out of this hole. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I loved that, I- that idea. The second reason that I really loved helping coaches is because I think there are, there are people out there who are underpaid and under-respected for the wisdom that they offer. Mm. You know, For instance, we're working on a program now called Defend the Home. And Defend the Home is where a police officer, off-duty or even retired, or a former military member of our military, can come into your home and go through a giant checklist of here's everything you need to do to defend this home and your security systems, your alarms, your if you want weapons, your weapons, how you keep those very, very safe mm-hmm. uh, from kids. Let's go through a protocol of what happens when you hear glass breaking in the night. This happened because I would personally was threatened by somebody with a mental health issue mm-hmm. and wow. had to have o- overnight security for about two weeks while we got eyes on that person. And it turns out they were a homeless person with mental health issues. Uh, and suddenly I realized, wait, I don't have a plan. I don't have a strategy. And then um, the other part of that was police officers, you know, the guy who actually spent the night at the foot of my driveway for a couple of weeks, he was paying, was being paid $35,000 a year. Mm. He was also running for sheriff. This was not a, yeah, they are severely underpaid. And so I want, I'm, we're starting a coaching certification so that former law enforcement, former military can, you know, go through this checklist, charge 2,500 bucks or $5,000, depending on the, the, the scope of the consulting to, to offer this. Well, there's a gentleman, officer cotton who guards my daughter's school as most, Schools are now guarded. Mm-hmm. He probably makes $45,000 a year. He's supporting his family. I can make him another fifty in 10 days. That's incredible. And also utilize his wisdom and his expertise. So we're partnering now with Bill Rapier, who was head of SEAL Team 6 on the night they killed bin Laden. Mm. Bill will not say whether or not he killed bin Bill Laden because he's, he's not supposed to. And he's very angry at people who are speaking up about that. Not angry, but disappointed. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, Bill's home is prepared to be defended against ISIS. He knows what he's talking about. And so, you know, Defend the Home will be a brand and we'll put it, the coaching certification inside of Coach Builder. But that that will help these police officers go from, wait a second, I, I can actually put together a CRM and a landing page and sell these products and do this in mm-hmm. one day a month and double my income. And that's the dream that I have. I want to do the same thing with teachers who mm-hmm. are, I believe, are underpaid. Mm-hmm. Imagine a teacher being able to come in your home saying, you know, here are the common characteristics of a household 
of parents of a child who perform extremely well in junior high. Mm. And let me walk you through those. Please send that you need to, to Yeah, you need to have <laughs> dinner four times a week together mm-hmm. as a family. You need to, you know, whatever those things are. Uh, that's a wonderful consulting gig. Uh, imagine uh, a, a nurse, let's say you get a health scare. Well, you could pay a nurse 800 bucks a month for a six month engagement to come into your home and help you understand which pills to take at which time so you don't get a stomach ache mm-hmm. and to understand that, you know, that one's a little more complicated uh, because there's so many different, different opinions on health. But, you know, so many of these underpaid people in society could do this. We're starting with business coaches. We have uh, close to 500 business coaches now. We're at, we'll add another 500 by the end of the year. Awesome. It will continue to grow. And then, as, and then what we do for those coaches is we put them in a small group to teach them to run a coaching business. We give them a CRM that we pay for that has hundreds of emails that I've What's written. a CRM? Just in a case CRM is a customer relationship is. management. Mm-hmm. It's a way to email people. It's like a database, sense. right? We teach you to yeah. use one because I, I think it's the primary tool that you're going to need to grow a coaching business. Mm-hmm. A lot of coaches are great with people, great bedside manner. They're effective at, at helping people change and transform and get wins in their life. But they have no idea how to get a client. Yeah. We help them figure out how to get a client. And we want to get them $100,000 the first year in their coach builder membership. Mm -hmm. So the vision right now, and it's working really well, is we provide you with all the tools you need to grow a coaching business. And then we provide certification in the business realm. We are quickly expanding to mindset, Mm -hmm. life coaching, and then hopefully defend the home coaching and all that other stuff. You you have really, with this book, uh, significantly disturbed my sleep. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know so if that's a good thing. In, in this book, he Sleep talks Sleep is about, akin to stress. You got to be careful. <laughs> I know. So, so he talks about eight steps, you know, to build your coaching business. We won't go into those. You can buy the book and do buy the book. And the book is Coach Builder. Coach Builder is the book. And you can find it where better books are sold. How to turn <laughs> your expertise into a profitable coaching career. And it's, and it's so like your head will explode. And I'm like a seasoned coach. I've been coaching for years and years and years. But this is causing my head to explode. We have three lightning round questions. Got it. So just prepare your heart. All right. The answers are three, blue, and sea biscuit. Perfect. Um, (laughs) What is the biggest obstacle for you in this season (laughs) to getting the double win? Uh, The biggest obstacle. That's a that's a terrific question. I mean, I I, for me, it's the biggest challenge is uh, having to settle. Having to say, hey, you're not going to get a big win here because it would cost you a big win there. Mm. Thomas Sowell has some great thoughts on trade-offs. Yeah. And he says, if you can begin to understand all of life involves trade-offs, uh, then you will begin to have a more, you'll have more success and more productivity. Mm-hmm. And so for me to say, well, you know, you're not going to be able to wake Emmeline up in the morning so that you can get some writing done. It's a trade-off. So you actually ask yourself, do I want a legacy of a better father uh, or do I want to finish that book? You know, I wrote a book every year for probably four to five years every year. And then when I became a dad was a year, immediately a year behind. Mm. And that to me, that was a trade-off. Yeah. So I chose to win in the area of being a parent and a husband mm-hmm. uh, and take a loss in the area of getting another book done. Yeah. And to me, that, that those trade-offs, that was trade-off was well worth it. That's great. Good way to look at it. Um, how do you personally know when you've gotten a double win, like a given day or period of life? Yeah. Not that it's ever perfect. I mean, we just go, that goes without saying. Yeah. You know, Viktor Frankl uh, has a, has a, something called logotherapy logo. And it's, uh, it's a, it's a, a, a therapy of meaning. Mm. So if you, if you experience meaning, it is healing. And he defines, the way to feel meaning, he, he gives a recipe for it. It's a, an objective that you have, a community that you're sharing your journey with, and a redemptive perspective on your suffering. Hmm. So you have to take every, every bit of suffering and say, well, what does this make possible? You're always asking, what does this make possible? Mm-hmm. So that you have a redemptive perspective on it. Yeah. Uh, if you do those three things, you will experience meaning. And, and he doesn't explain what meaning feels like, but I, I will give a stab at it. It's feeling that you are playing an you are playing an important role in an important story, mm. and so for me, going back to our earlier conversation here, I need to know what my story is about and what my role is in that story, and that role need that that story needs to be mutually beneficial. If I can conquer those three things, I feel terrific about life, whether or not I win or not. By the way, it doesn't actually yeah. matter. 
In fact, it, it, you know, I shared with Michael, uh, there was recently a, a heart scare in my yeah. life that ended up being a non-event that doctors were just like, okay, we don't understand. Uh, and the doctor has now cleared me and said, you're going to be fine. You have, you have the artery of a teenager, arteries of a teenager, you're going to be great. Plaque score of 57, which is ridiculous. Oh my gosh. And, envious, um, I am very envious. <laughs> but there were, there were seven days where uh, we didn't know. Mm. And it was one to five years. Oh. You're pretty much 100% certain you're dead in five years. 80%. 80%. We, 80% mm. certain. we were going back and forth during that. Yeah, we were. Mm. I was texting Michael. And um, what was amazing to me during that, that short, thankfully, season was that no accomplishments mattered anymore. I'm a very driven person, mm -hmm. very competitive, mm -hmm. you know, Enneagram three. Uh, and yet none of it mattered. Mm -hmm. I didn't care whether I finished the next book. I didn't care whether I got to run for office. The only thing that mattered was relationships. So it was a little, it was a little clue into what life was really about. Yeah. What a and gift. It is a gift. Yeah. A and it's gift. also easy to forget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get back into the game mm -hmm. and you forget that yeah. none of this means anything. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was a, a big realization that That's I had. That's great. Okay, last one. What is one ritual or routine that you rely on to do what you do? You shared some already. Maybe one you didn't share about. <laughs> well, cold plunge <laughs> would be the would be one. Don will uh, be sharing yeah, the, his affiliate the, link the later on. <laughs> yeah. So there's a there's a morning ritual that I do, uh, probably fifty percent of mornings, and I credit it with all of the success if I've had any hmm. in my life. Uh, it's it's all on a website called Hero on a Mission. It's completely free. Mm -hmm. We used to charge 10 bucks a month for it. And then we paid off our coders. And so it's like, okay, now it's just free. And so we, we have all, uh, 50 to 100 people a day who sign up for it. It's just a morning ritual. And basically, it involves, among a few other things, uh, reading your life vision, mm -hmm. which takes me about a minute mm -hmm. you know, to get through its bullet points, uh, reviewing my goals, uh, identifying the three primary tasks I need to get done today, identifying secondary tasks, mm -hmm. and then uh, writing down the things that I'm grateful for on mm -hmm. that day. And then there's this, this little slot for a journal entry. It takes me about 10 to 12 minutes if I read my life vision. Sometimes I skip that. Mm -hmm. It takes me six minutes if I don't. And I've been doing that for 10 years. And in that 10 years, I've lost 200 pounds of uh, Got married, became a father, written, I think, seven New York Times or Wall Street Journal bestsellers, built a multi-million dollar company. I would say in the last 10 years, I'm more productive than I'd been in the previous 40 wow. combined. And that is because of that morning ritual. Amazing. I'm signing up today. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Where do you do that again? Here on a mission. Here on a mission .com, And it's free. We don't, it doesn't, we don't even have a thing that we can sell you after you do it. So I need to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> you only need somebody in marketing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, again, thanks for joining us. Yeah. This has been amazing. And uh, we're going to be spending a lot of time together. Even this next week, we're recording the yeah. certification class for a uh, coach builder that uh, I'm doing. I'm looking forward I to that. I couldn't be more excited. I, I think, you know, if we can get five to 10 million people using Full Focus Planner, we've we've partnered together in something really significant. Mm. And, wow. You know, so I, I consider that part of my personal life vision. From your lips that. to God's ear. That's there right. There you go. Thanks for being here, Don. Thanks, Don. My pleasure. What in the world could we take away from this without taking another 30 minutes? I know. I mean, literally. So many things. I love that conversation. I did too. And one of the things that I love about doing this show is that because we talk through the lens of the double win, we get to ask people who are well known questions that maybe they're not getting asked all the time. And yeah. I, I'm just so endlessly fascinated by how people live and how they struggle through some of these things. And I really appreciated Don's candor mm -hmm. and how he's kind of used the story of his own life as and the evolution of that and the way that he's been intentional about making that a great story and really kind of pivoting his life toward meaning and purpose. He's used that to create a template for other people mm -hmm. to do the same. And now in his work with coaches to help people help other people do that. You know, um, I think my biggest way uh, takeaway besides cold plunges. Yeah. Hashtag cold plunge. Yeah. I'm going to definitely look into that. Just don't go crazy with it. I feel like that is the other part of that takeaway. Don't miss that people. Well, you don't know, the funny thing about it is I, I literally have considered it, Yeah, but the thought of it makes me so uncomfortable. Right. I, that like, I think like right now I feel cold. That? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I, I think one of the biggest takeaways for me was this idea of a hero in a hole. 
And that's true for all of us. And I think that part of the reason we're able to be increasingly helpful as we get older is because we've fallen into more holes. Yeah, right? so true. And we've, and we've struggled to get out of them. And so now we're in a position to point other people um, toward how to get out of the hole. Yeah. And I think, th- I think that was a fantastic insight. I do too. Gave us. Yeah. I, I also love the way that he's pursuing his family intentionally. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because we know him personally, we know that that's, that's really happening. And that ultimately for him, success is defined as meaning and meaning as other people see it, the people that matter the most to you, you know, your, his wife, his daughter, that ultimately he wants to do right by them. And if that doesn't happen, kind of nothing else matters. And I think that's true. You know, I think the research says that's true. I think our own experience says that's true. And I think he's a powerful example of, you know, because he got married later in life, he had kind of this before period and then this after period. And there was probably a during period that got him to the after period and I think it's instructive, you know, that that ultimately, you know, acting like the person that you want to become is a powerful way to become the person you want to become. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, one last insight I want to share, and that's just for those of you that would like to pursue the things that we talked about with Don. He's got a plethora of books and they're all great. I mean, I'm finishing Coach Builder right now and my head's exploding But the ones that are apropos to our conversation today would be A Million Miles in a Thousand Years, subtitled How I Learned to Live a Better Story, and then Hero on a Mission. Those two books, I really recommend that you get and devour. And listen to him if you can, because Don is a great reader. He is a great reader. And not every not every author is a great reader. Um, and you will enjoy. There, there's a sense of story just in the reading of the book that I think you'd miss if you didn't get to hear him read it. Guys, thanks for joining us today. We look forward to talking to you and introducing you to another great guest here in a week.